In our continual study, trying to lay some groundwork before our lectureship gets here, which begins on February 24th on fatal error in the Holy Spirit, we've been giving some fundamental matters, and I'm sure they'll be discussed again during these different uh, issues on the Holy Spirit during our lectureship, but these will help lay a good working foundation from what the Bible teaches on the work of the Holy Spirit, because there's about everything in the world attributed to the Holy Spirit. If you watch television and see how people think that you go through a spasm that's brought on by the Holy Spirit, uh, all this kind of thing, there's about everything attributed to Him. And yet the Holy Spirit, being deity, but the third person of the Godhead, a person, not a thing or an influence, operates as one spirit does upon another spirit. Thus, in whatever he does in dealing with you and me and all other men, that he's going to do it as we are made to understand and be led and guided and directed. And this ties in to some extent with our long study on the word of reconciliation because it's the Holy Spirit that revealed the mind of Christ in words on your level of understanding and my level of understanding. He fitted his revelation to man as he made man. And he doesn't go around it in communicating with man and leading and guiding and directing to man. Now let me emphasize again, we're not talking about the providential care of God. Providential care of God is God's actions on our behalf, what he does for us. <laughs> And if anybody could come up with something and says, well, he does this directly to us, not for us on our behalf, but to us, it would have to be something that did not influence and override our free moral agency. Each one of us must give an account before God for all of our beliefs and actions when we come before the judgment bar of God. That means I am in control and I choose what I do. Any work of anything must allow for that. When I say anything, when you had demons possessing people, as you read up in your Bible, we may not know a whole lot about them. The Jews thought they were basically spirits of wicked men who had been allowed to leave the Hadean world, the place of departed spirits where people go after they die, and to uh, come in and take over a person's body. I do know when I read in the scriptures that when a person was possessed of a wicked spirit, a demon, that person was not in control of himself. Uh, the demon used that person. And overrode that person's will. The Holy Spirit's not going to do that to anybody in getting them saved or keeping them saved. He's going to reason with us through words. Words are vehicles of thought. They are signs of ideas. And the ideas of God travel to us through the words God has chosen. And Paul made it clear in 1 Corinthians 2 in explaining Revelation that in the original languages of the Hebrew the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament, that these words were chosen specifically to represent the exact idea of God regarding whatever it is he was writing about. And thus inspiration gave those men the exact words. Paul said, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Well, what did the Spirit speak? He spoke words and he spoke them plainly or expressly. Paul knew when he was writing what the Spirit told him to write, even though the Spirit bore him along beyond the power of Paul so there'd be no mistakes. But he knew it. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. So Paul knew that he wasn't getting that out of his own human ingenuity. He knew God was giving him inspiration. He knew God was giving him his will in words on our level of understanding. Paul wrote down those words. That's why Paul could say to the Ephesians, when you read what I wrote, you'll understand what I understand in the mystery of Christ. So if I want to understand God's mind, I've got to read words. Now who revealed those words? The Holy Spirit. I never will forget hearing Brother G.K. Wallace tell about the fellow one morning who approached him. He was in a meeting in East Arkansas, a gospel meeting. It began on a Sunday morning. He was staying not far from the church building. And he decided it was such a beautiful morning, he would just walk to the church building. And as he was walking down the street, this fellow came up and met him. And uh, 
the fellow simply said, uh, or asked him, said, Were you, are, are, you, are you a Christian? He said, well, certainly I'm a Christian. He said, well, I just, I just wanted to find out because the Holy Spirit sent me over here to ask you if you were a Christian. Brother Wallace said, oh, no, said, the Holy Spirit already knew I was a Christian. I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he knew that must be some other ghost after you. <laughs> well, that makes it funny, but it emphasizes a very important point. If you're getting thoughts contrary to the words the Spirit has revealed, it is some other ghost after you. It is some other spirit after you. It's the devil after you. Anytime you've got a thought in your mind that runs contrary and contradicts the word of the living God, while, of course, I'm not saying it's the actual voice of Satan like you hear my voice now, but I'm just simply saying mark it up to being the, the, the influence of Satan. We have an absolute objective standard of truth set out in words that if people want to know them, they can know them. If you continue in my word, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. He prayed, Father, sanctify them, set them apart, make them where they can serve me faithfully, which means they must become holy. Set them apart, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. And Paul said, preach the word. And in putting on the Christian armor, Ephesians 6, 17, we learn that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It's the instrument the Spirit uses to prick people in their hearts. The fact that they're sinners, that Christ is the Savior, and that they need to obey the truth. So I assert it to be a fact that everything that is claimed to be affected by a personal direct work of, the, uh, work of the Spirit in the inward man or upon the spirit of man is as clearly accomplished by the Spirit acting through a medium, which is the Word of God. So when all these people talk about the Spirit told them to do this and the Spirit told them to do that, and I had this hunch and this notion and this feeling and all that kind of stuff, you can get the same evidence from witch doctors and patent medicine salesmen and used car dealers and give you the same kind of testimony that some people do otherwise. But if you want to know what the Spirit really said, go to where he revealed the mind of God in his sword or the instrument he uses to destroy sin and to prick people in their hearts. What do you think pricked those people in their hearts on the day of Pentecost the first time the gospel was preached in its fullness if it wasn't the Word of God? And the Spirit did that. I'm, I was convicted, and if I'm ever to be convicted again of sin, it'll be done by the Spirit. Anybody converted today is converted by the Spirit. Anybody that's living a faithful Christian life is led by the Spirit to live it. But that doesn't mean he does it directly. He does it through a medium, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, the Word of God is quick and powerful. It's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and to the divining asunder, the soul, the spirit, the joints, marrow, the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, how much more powerful can you get than that? That's why we ought to preach the word in its fullness, rightly divided. It will reach who God wants it to reach, and it will cut out all that God doesn't want there. You dilute the word of God, you can have people coming in the church God doesn't want there. You ever think of that? If you water down the word of God, if you compromise it, it's going to draw people God never wanted there. And it'll keep people out that he wants there. It must be the pure, unadulterated proclamation of the whole counsel of God. And that will bring people in that God wants there. That's what it's designed to do. You can't tamper with it. You can't mess with it. And it's not a better felt than told thing. But I don't want to rest just content with asserting what I said a moment ago. I want to show you from the Word of God itself what I just uh, set out as a proposition, you want to call it that. Well, a person must have faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God to be saved. Nobody is going to be saved without confidence, trust, faith, belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Jesus said to the Jews of his day in John 8, 24, Except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. That's pretty plain. It's a fact, it's the truth. People have to know that. I don't know how some people that are so moved to 
afraid they'll say anything unless they won't be, or they'll violate the rule of love in saying it. I don't know how they get around, how they would manage to say that. There's, there's no easy way to say that, except you believe that Jesus Christ, Son of God, you'll die in your sins. Now tell me how you're supposed to say that with a smile on your face. It's just a matter of fact. Unless you are brought to the kind of belief Jesus was talking about in him as the son of God, you're going to die lost. Now that's the kind of preaching and teaching the faithful members of the church will do to a world lost in sin and must be brought to a proper faith in Jesus Christ or they're going to go to hell. You ever notice how you kind of cringe when you say that? Now why do we do that? Because most everybody's going there. And compared to all that's ever lived and responsible to God, most are going to lose their souls. And there's one reason why. Except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sin. Well, I have to know how faith is created in a person. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The evidence contained in the word of God proves that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the son of God. And that's how you're brought to belief in Christ. Well, the Holy Spirit could do that directly. There was a miraculous faith that you find listed as one of the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, I believe. Now, but I find, as I said, that as he might give us that faith directly, he does so, as I've been pointing out, through the word of God itself, Romans 10, 17. Well, somebody else says, well, he might enable us to enjoy a new birth by directly working on us. Nobody at all would say that, um, that he couldn't do that. You see, it's not a matter of what God could do. It's not a matter of what he can do. It's a matter of what he does. Now, the only place I know to find out what God does is to read where he told us what he does and how he does it. And I learned that it's through the word of God that he creates or brings about a spiritual birth or a new birth. Having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but by and incorruptible through the word of God which liveth and abideth. 1 Peter 1 and verse 23. Well, of course, the Holy Spirit might give us spiritual light. Might cause us to see what is true. And He might do it directly. And that's the point. People say He does it directly. But it's through His sword, His sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, that He does so. Psalm 119, verse 130. David said, The entrance of thy word giveth light. Well, again, the Holy Spirit might directly give us wisdom. There was a miraculous wisdom, wasn't there? Also listed in that same chapter among the gifts that was in the church by the laying on the apostles' hands. And the apostles had all of them. But they were temporary, weren't they? They were to work when the whole word wasn't here so the church could be what God wanted the church to be. I read that the scripture says, But abide thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a babe, Paul said to Timothy, thou hast known, American Standard says, sacred writings, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Then I also read from the Old Testament in Psalm chapter 19 and verse 7, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. But then again, directly working upon a person outside of Christ he could, without the word of God, convert us. But it's not a matter of could or can or would. Psalm 19.7 makes it clear that it's the word of God that does that. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And then spiritually speaking, he could directly work upon a person to open one's eyes to see what's right. From God's perspective. But I find in the study of the scriptures. That it's the Holy Spirit through a medium. Through the word that does that. Psalm 19 verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. 
enlightening the eyes. And of course, how many of us would love to have understanding of anything. That's what we're trying to do in this study of the Bible right here in this time period of the sermon. He might give us directly, independent of any agency, or maybe I should say just medium. But I learn in the study of His Word that He does that through the Word. Psalm 119, 104, David declared, Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. And He could directly work upon us to quicken us or to make us alive spiritually. But I learned from Psalm 119 and verse 50, This is my comfort in my affliction. For thy word hath quickened me. It is true also that he could directly come upon us to save us from our sins. But I learn that the scripture reads, Wherefore putting away all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness or overflowing of wickedness, receive with meekness the engrafted or the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James 1 and verse 21. That's the reason there are no Christians where the Word of God has not been properly taught and believed and obeyed. And it strikes me that if God wants everybody to be saved and the Word of God says He does, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, then all of these thousands upon thousands, yea, millions upon millions upon millions of people throughout the world that may not even know what a Bible is, that's where you ought to be moving directly. Why depend upon the word of God in the hands of men to be proclaimed to people since God loves men so much? Why won't he move directly since some people believe that he does move directly without medium of the word to teach and direct people? Why won't he move right now in China? Why won't he move in the Middle East? Boy, that changed things a lot. Why won't he move anywhere directly, independent of a medium, and get all these people saved? But that's not the way it works. And yet, it is the Holy Spirit as well as Christ and the Father who saves us. But He does that through the Word. And that means that man must do what's necessary to understand the Word and apply the truth of the Word to his life. And that goes back into what we said many times about how God made us. With intellectual, rational being to take in information, reason with it, understand it, come to conclusions, either reject it or else submit to it by our free will. So sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, as we said earlier, John 17, 17. Well, he might purify us in the sense that uh, sin has corrupted us, made us impure. He might do that directly to us without the word. But I learned from Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. He says to those who were purified, seeing ye have purified your souls, in obedience to the truth and to unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with pure heart fervently. Now so far we've covered things. It says, well, the Holy Spirit does this directly. You don't even have to have the Bible. But we've seen that it's the Bible, the sword of the Spirit, that does it. And even then, it doesn't do it unless people, as God made people, attend to those words as God intended. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. No wonder Paul said, study to show thyself approved unto God. A word when they need not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 And it's no wonder then the light of what we said thus far from God's good word. Why Hosea would say of old, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Knowledge of what? How to make peach pies? No. God's will on salvation and the importance of man knowing it and submitting to it and being guided by it. Well, he might cleanse us, but he does that through a medium which is the Word of God. John records Jesus saying this in John 15 to the apostles in verse 3. Now, or as the American Standard says, already. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Well, how did they become clean? It was through, that's an avenue, 
It's how things flow. You know, water comes through a pipe. All right. How they uh, were cleansed was through the Word. What does the Word do? It enlightens. What we've been noticing from God's Word, it does. It enlightens a person, gives them understanding, gives them wisdom. And that's what Jesus was saying concerning the apostles. They were clean through the Word. Well, if the Word is the instrument used to clean them spiritually, what if they hadn't received the Word? They wouldn't be clean. Well, He might make us free from sin, the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. But I learned, too, that He does that through the Word of God. Paul wrote, reminding Christians in Rome of what they did in becoming Christians to motivate them to greater faithful service in the church once they'd been baptized to Christ. Said in Romans 6, 17 and 18, But God be thanked, that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart, now watch it, that form of teaching, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Romans 6, 17, 18. So it's rather obvious then that he makes us free from sin, but he doesn't do that directly without a medium. And he doesn't do it through the Word of God with our, our willingness to understand it and where God requires things of us to fulfill those requirements. And thus we find in Hebrews 5, 9 that he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. He might impart unto us the divine nature directly. You might say God could do, couldn't He? It's not a matter of what God could do, what He has the power to do. It's what He does. Listen to what we have, another familiar passage of Scripture. Peter again writing as the Spirit inspired him to write it. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. Whereby He hath given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That's important, isn't it? Given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Now listen. That by these, these exceeding great and precious promises that He's given us, ye might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Again, a medium's involved. The will of man's involved. How teachable a person is is involved. Is he teachable or is he not? If he's not teachable, he's not going to be saved by the Spirit. But He might fit us for glory in heaven with Him directly. But He ever on our part. But I read in the Scriptures, such as in Acts 20 and verse 32, where Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders and says, And I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, the word of His favor, which is able to build you up why? And to give you the inheritance among all them that are sanctified. The Word of God is able to cause you to possess the inheritance. But He can't do it if you don't want to do what He says. If you reject it. If you've got your mind made up, you're not going to do just exactly what you know the Bible just told you to. So you see, several things are involved in our salvation. That's why Peter told those of the day of Pentecost, after they had cried out, many brethren, what shall we do? And he told them, of believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children, all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And many other words. What did he do? He said, save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. Well, here Christ, I thought, saved us, and God saved us, and the Holy Spirit saved us. There are numerous things in the Bible that tells us that several things save us. The blood of Christ saves us. And now we see we have a part in it. We save us. But we don't do what Christ did. We don't do what the blood did. We don't do what the Bible did, because the Bible saves us too, you know. Not any one thing saves us. And the whole denominational world falls flat on its face and it says, all you have to do is believe. One thing, believe only. Well, it's not an only. 
How can you say belief only saves and yet say at the same time the blood of Christ saves? And as far as I know, those folks who say belief only saves turn right around and say uh, blood saves. Now, that's two at least. Well, will they say the Bible doesn't save or they will still the Bible saves? Will they say I have no part to play in my salvation? Even so, I won't even hear and understand the word preached. That's my part, you see. I have to hear and understand. There are a host of things that save us. The church saves us by doing what God said the church ought to do in preaching the gospel. The gospel saves us. Just a matter of understanding what place it, it plays. Belief saves. Repentance saves. Confession of faith in Christ saves. Baptism saves. But baptism all by itself doesn't save anybody. Any more than belief does. Each one has its place. Belief won't do what baptism does. Repentance won't do what belief does. None of them will do what for the faithful child of God, one that's already a Christian, that the proper worship will do. Isn't it true that I can say the Lord's Supper saves us? Isn't it true that I can say worship and God saves us? It all has a part to play at given stages in our life when it comes to salvation. So the Spirit saves us, but not directly. He might even strengthen us directly. Some people believe that He does. But I find that uh, it's through the Word of God that He does that. Strengthen me according to Thy Word. Psalm 119, verse 28. Now in these given cases that we have noticed in the last few minutes, we have examined, as far as I can tell, all conceivable things a direct work of the Holy Spirit could do for somebody. We've also shown that all things that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, does, He does through the instrumentality or the medium of the Word of God, which the Spirit Himself called the sword of the Spirit. This all needs to be understood. People have this notion that anything to do with the Spirit is something like a ooh, bump in the dark. It's mysterious, better felt than told. While it's as logical a thing as logic could ever be logical, God made man a certain way. He made man a certain way to understand anything. And concerning his salvation, the greatest thing man needs to understand. He's approached him just exactly like he made him to understand anything with the gospel that men can know through study because they understand words, words that God guaranteed to express his will in giving us those words in the Bible. So I urge you not to be led astray by doctrines that cause you to think, well, I had a thought that crossed my mind last night. And it must be God leading and directing me. Well, you might go back to that three bowls of chili you ate at nine. That has a lot of way of talking back to you about three in the morning. And then somebody said, I just, oh, I just had this warm feeling. There's some of the babies around here. If you take their diaper off, you can hold them a little bit in your lap and you'll get a real good warm feeling. My point is not to be ludicrous. My point is, you can't tell anything by just a feeling, except you had a certain feeling. You don't know what caused it. I won't ask Buddy to get that again. We did that last week. Now, Buddy felt something when I touched his ear. He had his eyes closed. He felt it. He didn't know what caused that sensation. You all were watching, those that were here. You knew I took off my wedding band and touched his ear with it. It took testimony, either from me or somebody else, as a witness, so he could know what caused that sensation. Now, what if we had been a bunch of pagans and said, that was a spirit tickling your ear to let you know whatever it is you want him to know. Now, if you've been taught that, and it's been drilled into you, and you come from that kind of background, then of of course you're going to start saying, that was the Spirit nudging me. The only nudging, if you want to call it that, that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead is going to do, 
And anything that pertains to man's conduct on this earth, whether becoming a Christian, at what point one becomes a Christian, or in living the Christian life and worshiping God and the organization of the church and the worship of the church is in these words. And that's why Jesus said of the New Testament, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. And that rules out anything that goes bump in the dark. I can understand what my God requires of me to become a Christian. I can know just exactly what I must do and know exactly when that I become a Christian. And I know as a believer in Christ, having repented of my sins, understood what repentance was, confessed my faith in Jesus Christ as the Word of God says, I know when I am immersed in water by the authority of Christ, obeying Christ from the heart, that when I rise to that watery grave of baptism, my God in heaven, it says your sins and your iniquities are washed away in the blood of Christ. Because I was baptized into his death where he shed his blood. That's why I'm raised to walk in newness of life. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's exactly how you know that you know that you know that you're with God or that you're not. Because when you know the Word of God and you know you have not complied with what you read and understand God said for you to do to become a Christian, then you can know you're outside of Christ. And you can know how to get into Christ. There's no funny business about it. There's no spookiness. It's simple and plain and thus we must receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our soul if you're not a child of God we urge you to become one this evening we have discussed how to do that as a child of God if you have sinned then we urge you to recognize that be honest with God and yourself repent of those things and come confessing them and we'll pray with you and for you that our God in heaven will hear a humble prayer and forgive you Know where you stand with God when you leave this building this afternoon. So if you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come. We stand and sing.